Hi, this is Barry List. It informs the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. You're listening to Science It Better, a series of podcasts about ways that analytics and math modeling help people like you and organizations like your own. Big data provides big challenges, even for experts in advanced analytics and operations research. In today's segment, we talk to Dr. Brian Keller of Booz Allen Hamilton. At the 2013 Informs Analytics Conference in San Antonio, where we are right now, he gave a talk entitled Getting Started with Big Data Analytics. Dr. Keller, welcome to the Science of Better. Thank you, Barry. And first of all, a definition, how do you view big data? Is it lots and lots of data points? Is it a huge number of data points that are difficult, to, that defy analysis, traditional analysis? Yes, uh, I look at big data as data sets that are generally larger than what you could fit on a single machine. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that ends up being... That's a nice encapsulated definition. If you can't use traditional technologies with it, then that, that ends up being a big data problem in my So you mind. look at it as a storage side rather than... The, the, the storage side is, for, for me, I think if you ask 100 people, you'll get about 90 different answers, but there's going to be a lot of overlap in it. Right. It's kind of like if you ask someone someone what analytics is, you'll hear a couple different answers too. Sure. Yeah. In my mind though, it's when data will not fit on a single machine, then you start you start running into big data. What what I would call big data. There are other features of big data too, such as uh, oftentimes the data is unstructured or semi structured. Mm -hmm. Now, unstructured usually refers to video and audio, or? Uh, well, video and audio could be unstructured data. Mm -hmm. Also, some text files would be unstructured data, such as Interesting. Uh, computer network log files. Uh -huh. So there is, structure, there is structure in computer network log files, but there's a, a piece of it called the user agent string, mm -hmm. where there's just a bunch of words in that, that part of it that describe what type of computer might have access the internet resource and oftentimes you need to do some parsing and cleaning of that to do follow-on analysis so that's just one example of semi-structured data something like SQL is very mm -hmm. good at handling structured data and not not the best choice for for big data problems because SQL databases will it's difficult to make them grow and scale to the size that they need to be to, to hold data big data. Now, you use an interesting um, illustration, a, a line graph uh, in your presentation. Tell us a little bit about it and how it applies uh, to what we're talking about. Sure, sure. So you made reference to the chart I showed yesterday on Moore's Law, right. showing CPU processing power and how that's just growing um, exponentially. Well, the point I wanted to drive home there is that the traditional way of dealing with large data is just to buy a bigger system. So there are plenty of commercial data warehouse providers that you can buy very large storage systems. And if you overflow your, if your data, data demand overflows the capacity of that system, you've got to go and buy a bigger system. And at some point, <clears throat> you just can't buy a bigger system. Uh, the other piece of that chart was talking about things like network, uh, internet speed, right. um, the availability of RAM and the growth of RAM. Mm -hmm. And then what stayed, has stayed real constant is disk I.O. And so if you're trying to process very large files, you're not going to store them all in memory. They're going to be on disk. If you can only read at 300 megabits a second, you can only process 300 megabits a, se a second of data. But if you string 100 of those disks together, now you can process 30 gigabytes of data per second. So when you look at traditional data storage systems, they're scaled vertically. And you can only grow a, a database to be so big. Uh, but with cloud computing technologies such as Hadoop, they scale horizontally. So if you need more capacity, you don't buy a bigger system. You just buy more components and plug them into the system. Now tell us about Hadoop. It's become uh, uh, more and more of a, a term that's being used. Uh, some people out there might not be using it yet. What is it? What does it do for you? You've already hinted at it. <clears throat> yep. Hadoop provides a distributed file system. So if you have very large files or very large sets of data that can't all fit on one machine because they're just too large, what Hadoop allows you to do is 
break the data up into smaller chunks and distribute it across the cluster. So that does two things for you. One, it allows you to store large amounts of data. And two, since all the files are spread across the, the cluster, now you can process all that data in parallel. So when you get back so to- So it gives you both the storage and the analysis. Uh, right, it gives you storage capabilities and it also allows you to do parallel processing and computation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that there are many choices on how to implement uh, analytics as far as big data. You, you talk about uh, Java, Hive, and Pig. Do you want to go into those a little bit and, uh, and into some of the choices and what's sure. good and what's bad, how you compare them? Sure. So uh, just like any, any type of analytic method, there's multiple ways to do it. And there are different options on what you can do or what you can use to implement big data solutions. And yesterday, I just offered a couple of those solutions. There's a, a very healthy ecosystem, big data ecosystem with many, many tools. And I just focused on some of the, the most common tools that are available to people. But the main point of the discussion yesterday was that um, you can get started with big data technologies and it, it's not that scary. And I wanted oh, okay. to distill things down to what is easiest for people to use and what provides the most flexibility in, in terms of their usage. So when you look at that, uh, the chart I showed yesterday was kind of a, a synopsis of that. So you've got Java. The entire Hadoop cloud stack is written in Java. So it's very easy to write programs in Java because look, the cloud runs on Java. Uh, if you don't know Java, that's a problem, though, because, oh. well, if you don't know Java, you've got to learn MapReduce, and then you've got to learn Java on top of it. The other choices are Hive and Pig, and they both Hive and Pig provide a SQL-like interface mm -hmm. or a scripting language to specify analytic workflows. And what both of them do is convert your SQL-like script or script into a MapReduce job that runs behind the scenes for you. That's great if you have some structure to the data already, you, like no missing values in columns, and the, the columns are very easy to parse. Data is already arranged in columns. If the data is not arranged like that, you have to somehow put the data into some structured form that will allow these tools to operate on them. So that's where the challenge comes in. That's part of the challenge, sure. Some data sets that you work with, they're already structured, so you can use PIG right off the bat. Uh, the last piece I talked about was the Hadoop streaming API, which would be the same as, well, very similar to writing a, a Java MapReduce program, except you don't have to use Java. You can use any programming language that you like. You just have to make sure that uh, that program, like, programming language is installed on all the nodes in your Hadoop cluster. So this sounds very reassuring to people who were a little bit reticent about uh, uh, taking the first step. Sure. So lots of us have experience with some sort of programming or scripting language. And maybe that's R, maybe it's Python, maybe it's C. Well, you can use any of those, any of those languages on the cloud using the Hadoop Streaming API. Now, you uh, give an interesting example uh, for somebody who wants to uh, see how it's done. Uh, you looked at uh, national climate uh, center data on average temperatures and how they've changed in a period that could be 20 years, could be as much as 80 years. So how did you go about doing that? Sure. So uh, what I wanted to show in the talk was that you can get started with big data. And if you want to convince your company that it's worth investing in this technology, I wanted to show people how they could do that cheaply. So you don't want to go to your uh, CTO and say, I need 50 or 100 grand to build a cloud so I can experiment with it. Uh, Amazon Web Services, you can spin up a virtual cloud and only pay for the computation time and the data that you use. And that, that's a very low cost way to get, get started with big data. So with that intent in mind, I chose a data set that was already available through Amazon Web Services, mm -hmm. which is the National Convenient. Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration's... NOAA, yep. for sure. NOAA, NOAA's Global Summary of Data which has measurements from all around the world of temperature, minimum, maximum, wind speeds, precipitation, elevation. So it's not just one fixed point in the United States, but it, that's why it's classified I, as big data. I think there's around 10,000 10, data points or 10,000 locations. 
with data. And it's technically it's not really big data. The data set was 20 gigabytes in size, which may sound like a lot, but you can fit that on a computer and you could process it in a, uh, a serial fashion instead of in, in parallel. Um, but like but it's I, a good place to start. It's a good place to start. It's a data set that's easy to understand. It's a data set that's a, available on Amazon Web Services for you to experiment with. And it's something that you can write a, a MapReduce job on it and it'll execute in 20 minutes or so and it won't cost you a, a fortune to do so. So there are other public data sets available through Amazon that are at the terabyte scale, like the human, uh, different genomic data sets. Oh, I'm very much in the news and, and mm -hmm. something that captures people's attention. Right, so if you want to try your, your hand at terabyte size computation, you can do that too. So for somebody getting started out, here are some simple ways, uh, simple tools to use, and here's uh, a couple data sets you can start off with ahead of time. And after that, you'll know uh, if this is the path that you want to take. Sure, sure. And if you start getting comfortable with that MapReduce paradigm and you want to try analyzing your company's big data, well, you can do a, a low-cost trial by putting that into Amazon Web Services or, or some other uh, utility compute cloud out on the Internet. There are other providers as well. And so, final question, can you give us some parting advice on getting started with big data analytics for those who still might be a little bit fearful about putting their toe in the water? Sure. Well, don't be afraid. Uh, it's not as hard as it sounds. There, there are great internet resources. There are plenty of tutorials on Hadoop out on the internet. There's plenty of tutorials on actually the streaming API that I presented yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, the ecosystem is evolving rapidly, so it doesn't hurt to have a mentor that's already done this work and been there before. They can help you get started a lot faster. If there's someone in your company that's already done this, become friends with them and uh -huh. establish okay. a mentorship relationship. Sure. Um, but most importantly, just get out and try it and do it. The best way to learn is by doing, and so that's my recommendation. That's all the time we have today. We've been talking with Dr. Brian Keller of Booz Allen Hamilton. Dr. Keller, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Barry. And thank you for listening to the Science of Better podcast by INFORMS, the Institute for Operations Research and the Management Sciences. For more about operations research and analytics and this series of podcasts, visit us on the web at www.informs.org. Good day, and remember, keep on crunching those numbers. <laughs>